Hi everyone, in this video we're going to debunk the Netflix documentary called You Are What You Eat using statistics. If you're new here, I'm a certified math and physics teacher in Ontario who holds a master's degree in statistics. So before we start diving into the actual study and the documentary, I just wanted to talk about my own biases and my background. I'm a skeptic by nature, that's one of my bias, so I have the skeptical bias. I hold a master's degree in statistics, so I believe in evidence, that kind of thing, and updating your beliefs and communicating properly with aligning with the, the statistics. And I currently teach high school statistics, so just keep in mind I might make mistakes, I don't know everything, but I'm, I'm deeply involved in this stuff. And I recently took uh, Richard Michael Reed's statistical rethinking course, and that really makes you realize how difficult it is to make causal claims about things. And this is especially true in the food uh, research and even education research, as a matter of fact. And one of my main biases is I believe it's all about balance and there's always two sides and it's in the shades of gray and the devil's in the detail. So that's one of my biases. I'm, I don't have, um, not very extremist about many things. And of course, I was raised eating meat. That's a very relevant bias to, the, to this video. I still eat meat. Uh, my mother was a dietitian, and I was raised with tons of vegetables. So I believe in the power of vegetables. And I grew up in Northern Ontario in Canada where vegetables are hard to come by and health is not always a top priority. And now we can dive into the study design. And I won't go too deep because I want people to watch the documentary and think for themselves. But basically, they delivered food uh, for four weeks. And one group was for vegans and the other group was omnivore. So they split up 44 twins into two groups. And one group was a vegan group and one group was an omnivore. And obviously it was randomized. Um, and the twin is actually a pretty strong design because it um, controls for genetic variants. And then for the next four weeks, they could eat whatever they want, but it had to fall within their diet. And, now, and ideally, they would adhere to the diet pretty uh, strictly. But that was one of the main strengths of the study is by the food delivery, you control for the meals. And then you also look at the sustainability and the adherence by doing another four weeks. Obviously, eight weeks for a dietary intervention is not that long. But generally speaking, the study design is very well done. And it's more the statistical analysis and the um, documentary itself that I have my main critiques with. And then they collected a bunch of blood samples, food questionnaires and... Uh, poop samples for the microbiome, which we'll talk a little bit later. Okay, so now let's dive into the results. Uh, the main outcome, the primary outcome was LDL cholesterol. And the y-axis is the median change from baseline. So you can see the omnivores did not change that much from baseline, whereas the vegan groups did significantly change from baseline. And at the bottom, there's the p-value. So the p-value is significant, which means that there is a statistically significant difference between the omnivore group and the vegan group for LDL cholesterol. And the p-value is 0.2. And then the HDL, the uh, vegans had lower HDL and LDL is typically thought as the bad cholesterol. And there's more about that. You can read Peter Atiyah's book if you're interested. And I don't want to dive too, too deep in the in each result. Uh, you see that the vegans lost more weight on average, but a small change from baseline, while the omnivore group didn't lose weight that much. And TMAO is a measure of uh, inflammation, if I recall properly. But that's not the point here. The point is that they're doing a bunch of tests of differences. And when you do multiple comparisons, they said that a two-sided p-value that's less than 0.05 is considered statistically significant. They did not correct for multiple comparison. So this is a big issue when you do a bunch of comparisons and statistical tests is you actually need to have a lower threshold than 0.05 when you do a bunch of comparisons and I'll show you why. So this is an XKCD. A comic and all the links to the study are in the Google Slides in the description of this video. 
someone comes up and says jelly beans cause acne and then they they do a study the, the study comes out and it says we found no link between jelly beans and acne the p-value is greater than 0.05 and essentially the p-value is just measures if the results are due to luck right and five percent chance that's one one in twenty and then you can see that they say well apparently it's specific colors that cause acne and then they test each of the colors specifically and in this example just for the comedic purposes they test 20 colors and one of them comes out with a p-value of less than 0 0.05 and then obviously the news title is green jelly beans linked to acne, 95% confidence, only 5% chance of coincidence and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point here is when you do multiple comparisons, there's always a chance of uh, the results just being to, due to luck. So then if you don't uh, adjust your threshold, you could say that something is statistically significant, but it, it's probably just due to luck. So that's, that's one way to lie with statistics here. Honestly, the multiple comparisons thing is not that big of a deal. It's more the cherry picking and omitting of information in the documentary that's a big problem. For example, they never discuss vitamin B. And here's a quote from the actual study. Vegans had lower intakes of vitamin B, yet serum vitamin B. So they ate less vitamin B, but their blood levels were not statistically different from the omnivores at eight weeks. And they say that it's likely because of preserved stores in their own body. Long-term vegans are typically encouraged to take vitamin B supplement. So this is an example of they never talk about it in the documentary, yet it's a pretty important thing for people to know if they're gonna adopt a plant-based and especially vegan diet. Another example of lying in the documentary is when they show this chart, which is TMAO, and I'm, I believe it's an inflammation marker, and it's essentially due to consuming meat. And what they don't tell you is that they remove three outliers because otherwise there was no statistical difference, which might be odd. And that's why they remove those outliers. But still, you need to say you do something like that because then the, the reader or the person watching the documentary just sees two big lines with big differences between them. Well, when you remove Bill Gates from your sample size, it changes everything, right? So that's very important to keep in mind. And when you look at the overall p-value, it's close to 0 0.5, which is nowhere near significant. So when, yes, when you remove three outliers, you bring uh, the differences a lot bigger. Now the Netflix documentary really cherry picked the DEXA scan results. And what's not obvious is that they didn't scan everyone. And I emailed the author of the study, Matthew Landry, and he confirmed that they only scanned the eight participants who appeared in the Netflix documentary. And obviously they wish they, they'd done it for all the twins. And I think obviously it costs money and that would have been a good idea, but it's good to know in hindsight for future research. But still, they could have published just a, a table or a graph of the results, but instead they just showed anecdotally for certain people, which is very suspicious. So what I did is I took all the pictures in the documentary, like this one, for example, you see that uh, this is the vegan twin Pam lost uh, 7.6 pounds of weight while Wendy only lost negative uh, 3.5. And they, again, they cherry pick certain twins to show certain results that they want. So what I did is I put all the results and you can see that there's missing observations because they never show the charts. Why don't they show the charts for those twins? That's suspicious, but I'll let you make your own judgment. So once you have all the data, you can group it by vegan and omnivore groups to see the difference. Delta just means difference. So vegans lost 6.3 pounds on average, while omnivores lost 3.9. That makes sense because they consume less calories, as we'll see. Uh, the omnivores actually lost more fat, which is never discussed in the documentary, which is interesting, if to say the least. And for muscle mass, they actually provide the data for all eight participants and mention it briefly in the documentary that vegans lost muscle on average while omnivores gained muscle. And that's a pretty significant thing, especially when you think of longevity where muscle mass is a very, very good predictor of how long you'll live and your quality of life. So both your health span and your lifespan. So now when we look at visceral fat, they only showed 
the data for three twins and kind of four, they just mentioned half a pound. So why didn't they show the other two? Again, that's very suspicious. In the fourth episode, when they discussed the results, they discussed the biological age uh, measured by the telomere links. And this is a, only a preprint study. So keep in mind, that's not perfect. The link is in the description below. And it, it found that only five out of 11 systems had a significant difference. So again, they don't talk about the nuance and I'm, I don't claim that the documentary sh should show all the nuance. Otherwise it would take 20 episodes and it would be boring but they should at least mention some caveats here or that it's not for sure. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? And on top of that, the authors say of the, the biological age study say that it's crucial to acknowledge that the observed epigenetic age, epigenetic age and biomarker differences between the vegan and omnivore groups may be predominantly attributed to the variation in weight loss rather than solely reflecting the distinct dietary composition. So what this means is that if a group lost weight, that has been shown to uh, change your epigenetic age. And indeed, the vegan group ate less calories and lost more weight. So you can't attribute the causal effect to the vegan diet per se, but maybe the causal diet, is, the causal effect is mostly due to the loss of weight. And again, that goes to the causal inference being very complicated and messy. Now, there's a bunch of compounds, and that's what we're going to talk about. And the, uh, the authors in the main paper say, however, the biological mechanisms cannot be determined to be causally from solely the vegan diet alone because of confounding variables, i.e. weight loss, decreased caloric intake, and increased vegetable intake. So now let's just look at calories. And on Twitter, Christopher Gardner, one of the main authors of the study, uh, he appears in the documentary, clarified this misconceptions on, on Twitter. So I'll, again, the link is in the, the slides. And you can see that the food delivery, it appears that it wasn't the same amount of calorie. But he clarifies that it is the same amount of calories per meal. It's just that the consumed calories were not. So maybe some participants in the vegan group did not like certain foods, so they didn't eat as much, or maybe it was more filling or just less palatable. So they consumed less calories, even though the calories were equated for the food delivery. And both in the food delivery and the self-provided phases, the vegan groups ate less calories than the omnivore group. So again, if you don't have the same amount of calories, all bets are off to study because that's a big, big confounder here. And when you look, uh, a baseline, the vegan group ate 21 more kcals per day on average, while the, while the food delivery date negative 187 less, and in the self-provided phase, they ate negative 174. So about 150 to 200 calories less a day, which over time results in significant weight loss. At least that's the leading theory. And indeed, you can see that they lost more weight which makes a lot of sense. And another con confounder is that the macros weren't equated. And obviously, if you eat more protein, that can result in different muscle gains and just your metabolism might function differently as the macronutrient distribution is very important. And you can see that the omnivore group, as expected, ate more of their calories from protein. So that makes a lot of sense. And this is just another way of showing it, animal protein versus plant protein. In all phases, the omnivore group ate more calories. Now, another thing to consider here is that these are healthy individuals. They, at baseline, they ate three to four servings of vegetables, and a serving is def defined as one cup of leafy vegetables or half a cup of other cooked or raw vegetables. And they ate three to four, which is decent. And then in the food delivery group, they both ate above five servings per day on average. So that's, that's a lot of veggies. And the difference between 5.5 and 6.5 servings of veggies, is that enough to see a big difference? Maybe it is, right? So if you equated the, the amount of vegetables in all groups, 
maybe you wouldn't see drastic differences in epigenetic age and, and so on, right? So in the self-provided food group, you can see there's an even bigger gap in the amount of vegetables, which skews the results once again. Now, there's another couple limitations that hinder the generalizability of the study. It's a relatively small sample size. It's only 44 uh, individuals, 22 pairs of twins. And uh, there's 34 of those 44 participants that are female. So the results skew towards females, but honestly, I don't think that's the biggest deal in the world, especially for a preliminary study. But that's important to uh, consider when you're trying to infer results for a specific individual based on an average study con uh, comprised mostly of females, right? And another limitation is the sustainability and satisfaction. The vegan group at week eight was three out of five, while the omnivore group was 3.6 out of five. And honestly, not liking your diet and not being satisfied with your diet has, I'm sure has impacts on your overall quality of life, your mood and, and so on, right? And you can see the, the different categories. So that's one of the things they don't really talk, well, they didn't mention at all in the documentary, but that's, that's a significant factor. And on top of that, when you look at the intentions for the participants after the study, only seven of the participants said that they would closely follow all recommendations for my eating pattern. And of those seven, six of them were omnivores. So only one vegan said that they would stay a hardcore vegan and follow all the recommendations. And the vast majority, 79%, said they'd continue to follow, but not all recommendations for my eating pattern. You see that basically they all concluded, oh, I should eat a little bit more healthy, focus more on, on my diet, probably eat more vegetables and so on. But only one of the vegan participants said they would commit to doing it and really following all the recommendations. So here are my takeaways. Only watch episode one and four if you're curious about the study. If you're curious about learning more about the, the plant-based movement and all of that, then watch the whole thing and make make your own mind. Now, obviously, my opinion is not the end all be all. I'm just here to point some things out that I think were left out by the documentary. And one takeaway that I knew before, but I, I still conclude that is the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And even here, I don't like the word always. It's most of the time it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, just beware of one sided content. And I try to be two sided here. I believe vegetables are good still. Science and propaganda should not be mixed. I, it, it just, they're not good friends, in my opinion. Uh, what's more important than going strictly vegan is including more plant based foods in your diet. And that's Gardner, the guy from Twitter and one of the leading authors of the study. And I, I would agree with that, honestly. I think most people don't eat enough vegetables. Um, and th that's almost a hot take nowadays but i think that's uh, just good wisdom in general most of us can benefit from consuming more vegetables reducing meat intake is likely to reduce environmental impact again the hot topic and i don't i don't want to make strong claims here and i honestly think there are moral arguments to be made against eating meat and eating in general like you you kill life for your own life and that's morally suspicious, but kind of has to be done, right? And depending on your values, the lower diet satisfaction may not be worth it. And this is especially true given that most of the benefits of the vegan intervention can probably be attained through more vegetables, whole foods, and exercise while limiting the risk of going hardcore vegan. I hope that you appreciated the nuance of this video and make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thank you for doing the work. Mm -hmm.